Hey folks, my name is Mo Amir and this is Van Culler, British Columbia's bonafide culture and politics TV talk show. We have a very special guest tonight, a former Miss Teen USA, who you recognize as an iconic BC broadcaster. Over the course of her incredible multi-award winning career, she was the first female news reporter on CKNW News Radio. Of course, you recognize her from her legendary run as a news anchor for CTV British Columbia alongside her co-host Bill Good. What an incredible pair. She's interviewed global figures from Fidel Castro to Bill Clinton. She actually started her broadcasting career right here on Czech back in 1975. It's all coming full circle. She is Pamela. Martin. <laughs> Pamela, what an honor. Thanks for being here tonight. Oh, well, thanks for having me, Mo. It's great to be here. Oh, absolutely. So usually we get into the issues on this program, but I feel like for myself and I'm sure a lot of viewers, mm -hmm. we just want to know what have you been up to lately? What's the <laughs> life of Pamela Martin these days? Uh, well, it, I just keep having fun. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's it. That's my goal. Just keep having fun. <laughs> but you're out there in the community. I've seen you contribute yeah. to different organizations and charities. Mm -hmm. Well, I I'm on about five or six boards. Wow. And, yeah. And, you know, and I, but I like to do. You know, so I like to give back as mm -hmm. much as I can, but also play, um, play pickleball. I travel. I uh, play with my grandchildren. Okay. <laughs> you know. Now, do you consider yourself retired? I guess, although I'm really busy. So I, I guess I'm retired. You can still you know? be busy I, I, while I know, being I retired. Hey, does that mean I'm retired? <laughs> that means, I think <laughs> yeah. that's the criteria. That's it. Yeah. I think that's it. I mean, but it's a great time in your life to be able to give back because you have more time to do things. All those years I was, you know, involved in a lot of organizations mm -hmm. like the Coast Mental Health Foundation, Pacific uh, Family Autism Network and, you know, various the Canadian Cancer Society. And now I have the time to right. actually be more involved. Yeah. And, and so that's been great. Now, I know you're still a keen consumer of media. I ran into you at the Webster Awards <laughs> as well. Right. Do you miss it? I mean, you had such an illustrious career, but does any part of you go, you know, I, I wish I was back uh, interviewing people or I wish I was back at the anchor desk? <laughs> well, maybe for about five minutes. I mean, <laughs> you know, yes, a little bit. OK. A little bit. I mean, television news or being a news reporter, I would have to say it was the most incredible job you could have okay. to me. Being a beat reporter. Yes. It okay. was so much fun. Yeah. Well, even as an anchor, but then you can still do reporting and you know interviews that are interesting and I, I can't think of anything more exciting than that job more fun I mean that is the most fun kind of job so um that's I do miss okay then what don't you miss I suppose well I I I'm happy that I don't have to get up every day and go to work. I mean, there's just something about that. You no, that sounds up. pretty good, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. I, know. I think maybe I'm going to go skiing today or, you know, whatever it is you're, you want to do. Sure. I feel like the media landscape in Canada, in British Columbia, over the last 10, 15 years in particular, has changed dramatically. And one of the more concerning things that I think about is that there is a large swath of the population that really does distrust, quote unquote, mainstream media or legacy media. Mm -hmm. And whatever it is, they'll just say, oh, well, it's from this outlet. I don't trust it. How do we get here? How do we get to a point where so many people don't trust what they're seeing from journalism and journalists who, again, work by a certain rubric to get you information? Well, you know, I think a lot of that is more in the States than here. I mean, and I think... You should see my Trump. comment section. Oh, is that right? Okay. <laughs> I think we get it here too, but yeah, sorry. I do, I do, but I don't think it's as extreme. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I don't know how we got here. I mean, I really don't. I, I assume it's because really it started in the U.S. with Fox taking a, a position, being very clearly, openly you know, biased. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we know what happened. I mean, it just got worse and worse with Trump. And then we had recently the Dominion voting machine trial. Right. And, you know, it was very clear that they 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 were they were saying openly, you know, I don't really believe in this, but I'm going to put it on television because it's good for ratings. It mm -hmm. was just a business decision, nothing to do with being truthful or honest or getting the facts or trying to inform people. It was just about getting ratings. It was just a business. 
Yeah, I, I feel like some media critique is good and that's healthy for society mm-hmm. to look at particularly outlets and their patterns of reporting the news or blurring the line between editorial and news. But I think in general, we've gone from being critical to a lot of people just completely dismiss Mm -hmm. mainstream reporting and they'll believe some blog or some website instead. So did you see any signs of that, you know, a a dozen years ago before you had left the desk? Um, I guess. I guess a little bit of that starting to come. But I really do believe that viewers need to be critical, like to Mm. look at all news organizations with a critical eye. You can't just accept it blindly and just believe that they're they're always going to be telling you the truth. I mean, they they may have an agenda. And so you should you have a responsibility as a viewer to kind of participate in a way in you know, the the truthfulness of what you're seeing on television or in the media. Mm-hmm. So um, I guess it was starting then. And um, but, you know, it's it's much worse now. I mean, we're seeing a lot of newsrooms shrink and a lot of yeah. journalists migrating to become professional communications people. Mm-hmm. This seems like a big problem that we can't have tenable outlets based on the rate of shrinkage, right? Well, yeah, that's very scary. I think it's very scary because we need to have the news media. I mean, as they say, you know, democracy dies in the darkness. That's the Washington Post motto. Mm -hmm. And it's true, um, you know, without the news media out there holding people to account, politicians, police, etc., we're going to, you know, that could be a very scary thing. So are you optimistic or pessimistic in terms of where news media is going in this country? I mean, I I think we need to find a new model, a new monetary model because this one obviously doesn't work. I mean, Mm -hmm. people will not watch commercials anymore on television, for example. And there's no such thing as appointment television. Like people used to say, okay, six o'clock, let's sit down together and watch TV. And no one does that now. So, you know, I mean, I'm still a person who gets four newspapers, <laughs> but I think I'm a shrinking, very much a shrinking market. Yeah. You definitely and, have to find people where they are, I think, these yes, days. Yes. Yeah. Right? So people already know what the news is. They've already watched and paid attention. They've seen it online all day long. I mean, who knows what the source is? But anyway, they probably know what the news of the day is. So they're not necessarily going to sit down and watch a, a TV newscast at six o'clock. Sure. And and so that's why the ratings have gone down. And it's it's really been bad. I, I hate to see it because newsrooms are being gutted. Um, we know CBC has just announced 600 mm-hmm. people, another 200 who are not positions that won't be filled. CTV, I think, was it 1,300 or something like that? Really, There was mass terrible, layoffs, like yeah. Like right across the country. And then you get the newspaper. It's like down to four pages practically. Okay, that's an exaggeration, but you know what I mean. Yeah, like, they're phasing it out for yeah, sure. Yeah, and it's really scary what's going to happen. And people haven't been willing to pay. And I think that is the real challenge. How do we make this financially viable? Mm-hmm. You know, if you can't do commercials, people won't read, you know, the news, the ads in the newspaper. So what are you going to do to make money? I mean, I pay. Do you? I, I pay, yeah, for a couple of outlets, absolutely. Yeah. But again, how many can you can you really choose? Pamela, 2017, Christy Clark and the BC Liberals actually win the most seats in that provincial election. They didn't end up forming government, however. Uh, and now when we look at today in 2023, BC United, formerly the BC Liberals, have completely dwindled in support. Some have them polling around 15, 17%. How much trouble... Is this party, formerly BC Liberals, now BC United, how much trouble are they in right now? Well, I don't think very much. I mean, like, first of all, the election's a year away. And as we know, anything can happen. Sure. And there there have been, you know, other polls that have shown that it's higher, that they have more support. But I don't think if you looked at, if you added together the conservative support and the BC United support, I keep saying liberals, I have to force myself, (laughs) um, you know, it pretty much is um, what it traditionally is, which is a little over 40 percent. And the same with the NDB, a little over 40. I mm-hmm. mean, nothing's really changed. So I just think the only thing that has changed is that the BC United is separate 
right now, just temporarily, from the B.C. Conservative. But I really do believe that before that election, that those two parties, the two free enterprise parties, will get together and figure out how to be a coalition Oh, you think before 2024 they will cooperate? I I think they should. That's a hot take. Yeah, well, (laughs) yeah. Okay, maybe they won't, but they should. Yeah. Because if they don't, then they will be by themselves just re-electing the NDP. Well, and not only re-electing the NDP, but they risk being completely blown out, both of them, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, the polls are just a snapshot, a moment in time. It's a very small number. And let's never forget, Mo, about the 2013 Front page of the province with Adrian Dix, <laughs> which said this man could kick a dog and he'll still be elected premier. And so you're advising Dino. Premier David Eby not to kick any dogs right now, <laughs> to be clear. <laughs> no. <laughs> let's, let's talk no, about. That just shows how sort of almost irrelevant polls have become. Sure. Let's talk about Premier David Eby for a second, because he is polling quite well and the BCNDP are polling quite well. And what I find fascinating is that federally, Justin Trudeau and the federal liberals are really wearing a lot of these overlapping crises that we have. And yet somehow Premier Eby has been able to deflect, you know, whether it's affordability or health care, he's able to deflect these issues and I guess still somewhat empathize or sympathize with British Columbians and still poll very highly. What's the secret being to his success? Well, I'm not sure that he really is that successful. I mean, I oh. think if you, um, <clears throat> you know, I think that some other polls, not just that one you mentioned, mm-hmm. but other ones have shown that there are a lot of people who feel the NDP is doing poorly. I mean, they may like <clears throat> him as a person, but not really his government. And, mm. uh, you know, the BC United MLAs that I've spoken to say that, um, they're getting a lot of phone calls and emails and letters and, you know, the, of constituents who need help and who think that this government is not hearing them, is not mm. addressing their concerns. I mean, we have three main issues, I think, which is the affordability crisis, the health care crisis and the housing crisis. Mm-hmm. And I think that they... Um, you know, they're kind of some polls, other polls have shown that people think they're doing poorly in all three of those areas. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the newspapers or even television news, I mean, you'll see almost every night we have another story about someone who died on a waiting list to get in <clears throat> some kind of care at the hospital. And that's my point. I mean, we're, we're seeing this mm-hmm. and British Columbians are living this. And yet, again, they're polling above 40 percent, which is pretty good, right? It so, is. But they, they traditionally have had 40 percent. So okay. really, I just think that the the people who are going to vote NDP are still going to vote that way, or they say that in a poll. When we think of Premier David Eby, what do you see as his personal brand? And what I mean by that is, obviously, you worked with Premier Christy Clark, and she was a master at kind of branding herself. She was a great retail politician. She kind of softened that party with her family's first slogan. She's wearing the pink hard hat. Uh, Premier John Horgan was Premier Dad. How has Premier Eby kind of positioned himself as the leader of this province? Well, I guess just as a citizen who's observing it, I would say he's uh, sort of the man of action, you know, premier of action. So we're going to have a housing plan and we're going to have all these different, you know, bring in all this legislation, which kind of very quickly goes through the legislature and doesn't get to be discussed really very long. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's going to solve our problems. I mean, take the, uh, the, the latest housing legislation, which... You know, it turns out that it may not. He, he had very high um, percentage of that the housing costs will go down. Right. Um, by and they wouldn't explain why or how it had right? happened. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and then if you really dig a little bit deeper, not quite true. It wasn't actually what the modeling showed or, you know, there were so many assumptions around it that that it was very unlikely that it would be happening, as they said, because there's so many other factors. I mean, Mm -hmm. there's the world economy, there's the Canadian economy, there's interest rates and, you know, and and, uh, infrastructure and all those other things that matter when you talk about housing, how much you're going to be able to build, you know, will 
<clears throat> you know, what will happen to the world economy. What what brings down political leaders? Like when we think about Premier Christy Clark, she was so gifted as a retail politician, great orator. I think, you know, even if you didn't like her policies, if you met her in person, you were very charmed by her. Mm -hmm. When we think about what brings down leaders, what what is it usually? Is there a common thread? I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> People don't want to vote for you anymore. <laughs> do you think it's just if you've been around for too long, people just get kind of tired well, of I you? Well, I do think that's true. Yeah. Yeah. People get tired. It, it, you know, a lot of ideas, maybe they seem so fresh in the beginning, but then if they don't work out or they, you know, they drag along and then people get tired of them. And Do you think that leaders get tired at the top? Like, I do wonder... You know, I, th I feel like you're kind of seeing this with the federal liberals and with Justin Trudeau mm -hmm. right now is that they really want to convince Canadians that we're doing so good as opposed to empathizing and understanding that people are struggling. So is it does it cut the other way where it's actually leaders that kind of become a little too complacent or maybe just a little burnt out in their position? Well, it could be. It could be. I mean, I honestly I really don't know. No, I no. mean, you, you, you worked with a premier. So I'm just wondering <laughs> what you can draw from your own personal experience. Well, I mean, as you pointed out, like the B.C. liberals under Christy Clark didn't actually lose in 2017. Mm -hmm. They had more MLAs than the opposition, but they formed a coalition. Right. So I don't really think that we lost. I mean, we just didn't get to form government right. anymore, which is different. Do I think anything happened? I mean, you know, there would be different legislation that that she would bring in or bring up and you know maybe um her mlas you know we, we didn't agree with it and maybe i'm and i'm just totally speculating sure, yeah. but over time i mean eventually you're going to have arguments that maybe just become too big mm. pamela this was a pleasure thank you so much for your time tonight <laughs> thank, you. thank you mo Great oh to see anytime you're, you gotta come back pink. Thank pink you. is amazing. <laughs> Thank you look you. great. And watch the best. All of it. I appreciate Very that. Colorful. Thank you so much. <laughs> Folks, what a treat and what a return to check for one night only. She is, of course, the legend Pamela Martin. And thank you to Shelter Point Single Malt Whiskey for supporting local conversations. Now, after some business for two parties that seem to agree on a lot of policy positions, first and foremost being that they want the BC NDP out of power, it seems inevitable that BC United and the BC Conservatives will merge. So why don't they? I have some thoughts up next.